have been posting about the coach. Y'all, there's a trail like car lot this Saturday. We're going to start at 9. I think we go till noon. Okay? It's donations only. It's a free car wash. Donations are accepted. Trying to support and help our trail life crew community continue. Um, there's a lot of equipment needs, helping kids that are less privileged, that need to come to the trail system or the TV, all these kinds of things. This money goes into help, and it is an amazing program. The kids are benefiting. We have so many kids at our own church that are enjoying it and benefiting from it. We've also reaching out to the community, and kids from the community are involved with it as well. So if you can, if you haven't considered it, consider coming up and having your car cleaned. It's going to be a beautiful day, so it's a good day for it. And if you have not, uh, if you can't do that, you are certainly welcome to donate. And, and, and not have your car washed. Yes, and not have your car washed. <laughs> and also there's a Monday Cam uh, fundraiser that the kids are doing that you can just go online. The link is already up on the SC Women's page and on my Facebook. If you're not on my Facebook and you'd like to be, just let me know and I happily add you. Oh, um, and uh, but uh, that one, you just buy your gift card or your uh, meal through that link, and a portion of it goes to the troop. And it's no, you don't have to do anything else. You just just use it like anything else you would buy online to use. So it's super easy and will support and help our troops. So if you consider that, that would be another great way to support Trail Life. But we appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. if you're going to buy a honey baked ham for Thanksgiving or Christmas, yeah. do it through us. You yeah. know, you know, it's like you know. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah, they get 20%. So if you're going to do it anyway, yeah. just you know, find a Trail Life person or go online um, yeah. to our page and you'll see it anyway. Yeah, we'll have a table set up in the lobby on, on Sunday, Sunday morning. Okay, so you can do it there too. A couple weeks. Okay. All right, well, let's get started. You know, so the 1960s were infamous for being a time of rebellion, right? I mean, it was everywhere. The spirit of rebellion just spilled over into almost everything, you know. Uh, against the government and the Vietnam War, against morality, without kind of free love and all of that, against family, against traditional church. It was everywhere in the 1960s. But as crazy as a time as that was so long ago, um, I think today's world has really turned rebellion into an art form. I mean, it is an attitude, this rebellion is an attitude that says, I don't like somebody taking authority over me. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want you telling me uh, 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 what's wrong with me. I don't want any of that stuff uh, because what I think is most important, and that's all that really matters. <laughs> and so that's kind of the summary of where we are in our world right now. It's really frustrating sometimes. Uh, but what most people are doing when they have that kind of attitude is trying to maintain an illusion of autonomy, right? It's like, and, and it is an illusion. I mean, we assert ourselves in all kinds of ways, but the truth is we are never, ever out from under the authority and the sovereignty of God, no matter what we're trying to do. So all rebellion, whether it's prancing around in the most ridiculous ways on social media or on television or on the news, or just sitting quietly, all dressed up and all cleaned up on the front row of a pew somewhere, but resisting what God is telling us to do, it's all rebellion, and it's all offensive to God, and it's all that desire within us to throw off God's rightful authority um, over us. And so that's really what the writer of Hebrews is going to get into in chapter 3. And if you remember our outline from a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, this is just as simple as I could make it of what the whole book of Hebrews is about. And uh, we remember this purple block. We spent all of our time up until today in this purple block seeing how Jesus is revealed, uh, at, you know, his, his uh, true reality and how he's superior to angels, both in his deity and is in his humanity. So today we're going to move on into the blue block. If you don't have one of these, they're on the back back there. And we're going to see how he is superior to Moses and in the promise and to the promised land. So let's just jump into our text. And I hope if you're reading this week, you saw this word in verse uh, one. The therefore. Remember when I told you to look for these and highlight it and circle it? Because what it does is every time you see this, it connects a truth to a proper response. So he's saying right here, in light of everything we've learned in chapter one and chapter two about who Jesus is, 
It should then begin to challenge you, to change you, and to move you in a di different direction. So we're going to spend our time kind of taking apart what he says in chapter 3 here and cover the whole chapter today. So he says, beginning, therefore, holy brothers. So let's just start, stop on the word holy there for a second. And so the word holy just means set apart. Now, when God told the Hebrews all the way back in the Old Testament to make items for the temple, uh, they were to be consecrated. That's the first thing they had to do with them before they ever used them in the temple. And that would make them holy. That is set apart for specific and unique use in the temple alone. Now, so you couldn't, if your kid was having a wedding, you couldn't walk up to a priest, knock on the door, and say, you know what, I'm having a barbecue this weekend. Can I borrow the temple barbecue fork? And there was one, by the way. <laughs> you couldn't ask that because they'd be going, no, 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 no. We can't use this just for any, any reason. It is only to be used in the temple. Now, is a barbecue fork or a goblet or some trays uh, or a temple building for that mat matter, are any of those things holy within themselves? No, they're not. They're just metal or wood or stone or whatever they are. They're just common and ordinary and tell what happens. That is, they are consecrated or sanctified, we talked about that word last week, sanctified by the touch of God. Only his involvement with those things changes the ordinary things into extraordinary things. And so that's what it means here. And so in this instance, the word holy doesn't really talk about behavior at all. Now, sometimes you read the New Testament, the word holy does talk about behavior. That is, live holy, walk holy, act holy, but not here. What it means here is, it's referring to the position that believers have been given to us by our relationship to God. That is, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are touched by God. In fact, you are inhabited by God in, with the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. And so that's what sanctifies you. That's what sets you apart to His service. And so you are way more special than a barbecue fork. Okay, I mean, it's like the, everything about you has changed. The old has been made new, and this is a declaration towards you by God at salvation. Your life has been touched by Jesus. You are completely transformed. Given the righteousness of Christ, we are completely accepted in the beloved, which is what Ephesians chapter 1 tells us. So let's get keep going. So we have holy brothers. And so this links us back to what we talked about last week in chapter 2, that part of what Jesus did was to make us part of his family. And we saw three Old Testament references that tells us this wasn't a New Testament idea, that this was the idea all the way back in the Old Testament that God wanted to adopt us into his family. And we spent a good amount of time last talk, time talking about that he's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of you. He has brought you into his family and made you his very own. And so if that's a uh, you know struggle with shame and guilt and all those kind of things, go back to those verses from last week and highlight them and underline them and remind yourself over and over and over, out loud if necessary, look in the mirror and say, Jesus is not ashamed of me. And so that's really powerful and can transform the way you behave and how you think about yourself to understand that. So part of being in his family is that we also share in a holy calling. And that implies that we are joined together under, with a common undertaking. And that's like maybe think about it like a business partner a companion, somebody who walks with you. And here it means to share in possession of something. You become the common owner of something. And, and so we as believers share with all other believers this heavenly calling given to us by Christ. So salvation is the beginning point of that call, but it's not the ending of that call. And the word here, the calling here, is like an invitation someone would give to you to bring, invite you to an exclusive banquet or a party or something like that. 
And so as the holder of that invitation, you have gained all the rights and privileges afforded to those who, are, who can come. And so in light of Jesus' superiority, the angels, and all that we have learned about him in chapters 1 and 2, and what we have been given by him in this first verse, that is holiness, belonging, and a heavenly invitation, now what? Okay, so uh, the next word we see is that we need to consider Jesus. Now, that word consider isn't like we use, normally use the word consider today. That means like, okay, I'm going to think about it a little bit. I might roll it around in my head a little bit. And if I want to, maybe. That's kind of how we think uh, the word consider is. But the original Greek word for this means to fix uh, your attention to gain understanding. That's what it means there, and to direct your mind toward something. And the NIV translates this phrase as fix your thoughts on Jesus. So he says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. And it is an urgent plea. It has uh, an immediacy to it. Do it now. Don't delay. So the exhortation on the back side of seeing Jesus is superior to all these heavenly and created beings is to consider him. Now, in what respect should we do that? And this is where we move into the part about Moses. And um, so, but first he says, we need to consider Jesus as apostle and high priest. And so the Greek here only has the word the on the front side of apostle and not the apostle and the high priest. And since there's only one here, what the Greek uh, is telling us is to consider them together. And so Jesus is at once simultaneously the apostle and high priest. Now, unlike Old Testament priests, uh, he holds both offices combined. Now, the word, uh, uh, Jesus being referred to as our apostle, this is the only time in the whole New Testament that this is referred this word is applied to Jesus. Um, now don't get confused here because usually you think about the word apostle, we're talking about the 12 apostles, and that's what we usually think. Um, but the word there, apostle, means just one sent forth by another. So when we think about the 12 apostles, those are the 12 men sent forth by Jesus to take his message around the world. But Jesus here is the one sent forth by the Father. And so high priest here, now we're going to go into this a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it much here. That 7 and 8, chapter 7 and 8 cover this in a lot of detail. So, but the, just briefly, the idea of priesthood is that Jesus is our representative before God, that you can pray to him, bring him your sorrows, your struggles, and Jesus intercedes for us on our behalf to the Father. But it also goes the other way that Jesus also perfectly represents the Father to us. So if we want to know who God is like, we look at Jesus. We know exactly what he's like. We you know, want to know how God's going to interact with whatever you do or whatever happens or how he's going to respond to faith or lack of faith. Look at Jesus. What did he do when he was here? So it goes both ways. And so that makes him our perfect mediator, representing us to the Father and the Father to us. So then, he is the apostle and high priest of our confession. So, the word confess there, a lot of words here to learn, but the word confess or confession just means to agree with. Now, you know this, if you like to watch crime dramas, right? They got the guy there in the little thing, and they're grilling him on what happened, and then they stick a piece of paper in front of him and say, we want you to confess now. This is what we think you did. This is what, you know, how, we, how it went. Now, confess to the crime. That is, agree with us about what happened. That's what they're asking when you make a confession. So in this context, what it's telling us is that we, he's exhorting us to agree with God about who Jesus is. That's what he's saying. The high priest of our confession. And so getting a really good grasp of Jesus, that's why we spent the whole uh, chapters one and two talking about who he is, because when we understand that, then it impacts how we live, right? If you really believe that Jesus is high and lifted up and the creator of all things and superior to everything out there, it's going to change how you live. 
right? So, we, uh, so it motivates us to obey and to submit and to follow willingly. And so then the writer moves on and asks us to consider Jesus as greater than Moses. Now, this would have been a big deal to the first writers because there wasn't anybody greater in their thinking than Moses. And so this is a whole long section here, but it's basically what it's comparing here is the great faithfulness of Moses to the perfect faithfulness of Jesus. Now, Moses is not being diminished here. Jesus is being elevated even above the stunning faithfulness of Moses. And so he's going to give us a couple of comparisons here to show us what he's talking about to see the superiority of Christ. And the first one is that the builder is superior to the house, is what he says in verse 3 and 4 there, that I get much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. And what he's saying here is that no matter how amazing a building is, whoever designed it and built it should get more glory. Now, it's easier to kind of think about this for us today if you think about, like, great art. So if you were going to maybe get on a plane and fly over to Italy and you're going to go see the statue of David, right? Walk into the place and look at it and you, you went, wow, what an amazing piece of marble. Yay, statue that you created yourself like that, right? That would be silly, right? No, we would stand back and go, wow, Michelangelo, you're amazing that you could make that out of a piece of rock. So we gl uh, glorify and applaud the one who made the, p the statue, not the statue itself. And so uh, this is the same idea of what he's saying right here. So Moses' declaration and his dedication to God and his faithfulness to God was impressive and amazing. You just read the Old Testament, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and you go, wow? <laughs> I mean, how did he put up with all those people? How did he lead them out like this? I mean, and so, uh, <laughs> but he definitely was a created being. He's like the statue or the house. And we shouldn't look at him or anybody else, uh, for that matter, and go, wow, Moses is the greatest ever. And that's exactly what the people who were reading this were doing. And uh, so while he was certainly an astounding man of faith that, we, that we're going to learn a lot more about when we get over to chapter 11, even so, he did not create himself. Jesus did that. And the honor due him is greater than the honor due Moses, that's what it says in verse 4. Now, in our day, this is a really great reminder to check ourselves on Christian hero worship, okay? <laughs> There's only one who is due any worship at all, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, his, uh, and I remember I was at another church, and they had a very, very marquee person, uh, you know, that you hear on the Christian radio all the time who was leading worship that day. And so I was working at the resource counter with a bunch of other girls there. And so here comes, the, after it was over, and he was got his two little girls, and he's got his little pink uh, My Little Pony backpack walking out through the lobby there. And all the girls were going, oh my gosh, there he is. Oh my gosh. And I was like, stop it. Stop it. Okay? Because this man is only doing what God called him to do. Just like you should be doing what God called you to do. And, and just because he has a platform and you serve little kids at your house or quietly in, at, uh, at your office building or in your own, around your own families does not elevate him anywhere. You are called to do what you're called to do, just like he's called to do what he's called to do. And a platform does not make him any more special. Your faithfulness, when no one sees you, is just as, poor, as important as that. No pastor, no singer, no writer, nobody who's out there in the spotlight should get our attention more than Christ. They are the building he is the builder. Okay, and so let's move on. And so now he talks about the son is greater than the servant. And he kind of gives us two observations here. And the first one, he says, 
that Moses was faithful in all God's house as servant, Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Now, we don't need to talk a lot about this because it's pretty pretty straightforward. So you can see that Jesus was is God's son. Moses is only the servant. And so the, and we can see the elevated nature of a son over a servant. Pretty straightforward, like I said. That's all he's saying there. And so the second point is that he testified, that's Moses, to the things that were spoken later. Now, what he is saying here is that Moses gave, through his faithfulness, gave us previews of things to come. But Jesus is the one who actually fulfilled those things that were prophesied about. Now, of course, Moses didn't know Jesus by name. Uh, but the way he testified to Christ had a lot to do with the law and the tabernacle that we'll talk about later. But, uh, but we here on the other side of the cross, we know that all of that stuff was shadows. Jesus is the reality. And the big portion of these chapters that we're going to get to are going to reiterate that point over and over and over again, that all the stuff from the law and the tabernacle and all the things in it, the priestly uh, rituals and all of that, were fulfilled in Christ. They were pointing toward him. He's the fulfillment. He, and so he's Jesus, he's the son, and he is the heir of all thing and the things and the fulfillment of all those promises. So... Moving on to uh, Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. So we've got another therefore there. I hope somebody uh, circled that and saw that when you were reading. But it's, so it's connecting, once again, a truth to a proper response. And our proper response to learning all of those things is going to come within a quote from Psalm 95, which is what the rest of this is here. And so before we explore that, that quote, see what the writer's telling us, don't... Don't skip over this introductory phrase here because this is kind of spectacular. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament. David wrote this, but the writer introduces this quote from the Old Testament, not as authored by David, but as authored by the Holy Spirit. So right here, he attributes the writing of, of the Psalms and, by extension, the Old Testament to God himself. And that, these clear words, from, he's saying this is from God himself. It's not just somebody who wrote it out there. And so notice it also said, doesn't put this in the past tense. It doesn't say as the Holy Spirit said, but as the Holy Spirit says present tense. So that's a reminder to us that he is speaking right now. These are not old words or flat and lifeless words lying on a page somewhere. It reminds us that if you are reading these, when you're reading in your Bible or you're reading these words on the screen, that the Holy Spirit is talking right now. He is currently actively speaking through these words and all the words of Scripture to talk to you. That's what it's saying here. It's always not him, whether he's speaking or not, but whether we choose to listen and respond. So back to the uh, quote itself. So with a recognition again of Christ's superiority over Moses, there is then a call to action. And the first thing he says in these verses is, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. And so this, he gives, goes on here and gives us a, an example from Israel's wandering in the desert. And I hope if you read this this week that you look at the passages from Numbers to refresh yourself around this story. But if you didn't have it, uh, and didn't have time, uh, you probably know the story anyway. God used Moses to deliver the children of Israel in an overwhelming and dramatic fashion from the bondage to and slavery of Egypt. And then they come right up to the edge of the promised land, and then they rebel, and they grumble, and they complain, and they want to go back, and they want uh, leeks and onions, and you brought us out of here, and we're going to die, and all that kind of stuff, over and over and over again. And as a result, God denied them from entering into the rest of God. And now the rejection of God is kind of stunning after all they've seen, right? I mean, you think, well, if I had seen a pillar of fly, uh, a pillar of uh, fire at night, and if I had seen plagues and all that, then I'd follow God, but 
we're really not any different. I mean, we, we have, God works in our lives, and in and, and two weeks later, we're going, yes, but where are you, God? I mean, we're just like that, and it's a reminder from the book of Hebrews. It says, don't be like them. Don't be like that, because they spurned the grace and the love and the mercy of God, and they rebelled against him. And they complained. And as a result, God sent judgment on them. And that is a whole generation would not experience the rest offered to them in the promised land. And so he just says, don't harden your hearts. And then he says in verse 12, take care, brothers. And the word for take care here means beware. Or if you put it in a positive spin, it means to be watchful. That is pay attention. Now, before we go on here, there are a lot of difficult passages in the book of Hebrews. Uh, these warnings sometimes can be very stern and kind of start making you nervous when you read them. And these, you, these passages here have been used by people who believe you can lose your salvation uh, at, to, to bludgeon Christians in them and kind of scare them into, oh, if you don't straighten up, then God's going to steal your salvation from you and you're going to be out. And that's kind of the way that sometimes it's preached uh, or taught these these and you know there's a warning at the end of every passage here and they're they're a little difficult sometimes uh, if you just read them on the surface but a couple things to remember anytime we look at difficult passages and people wrestle with this all the time and it, it causes a lot of undue anxiety and worry about yourself or about somebody else and it, it, am I going to lose my salvation? What about if you turn around and walk away? And what if, what if you just keep on in sin for a long time? What happens to you? What happens to people who turn their back on God? What, 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 what then? Well, interpreting difficult passages, the important thing to remember is that you must interpret them, these things that are hard to understand, through what is clearly taught in Scripture. That is, pull out and what you, you know it says, what's easy to understand, and you must lay that over the top of something that's difficult to understand. And so I made a sheet for you. It's on the back there if you didn't get one when you came in, of three pages of Scripture to help you understand what happened to you at your salvation and why it cannot be undone by our behavior. And in these days of Christian uh, deconstructionalism, and you hear about all these fantastic things about these people who were walking with God, and now they suddenly turn their back on God, and they're, they're saying all kinds of crazy things here. I mean, it's hard to know make, how to make sense of that, right? It's like, wait, I thought they were this, that, and the other. But you have to remember that someone who grew up in church and went to VBS and made a public confession and uh, went to youth camp, and been around church for a decade, that does not necessarily mean they had a heart transformation, okay? Because people can grow up in church and learn the language of church and never have made it personal. Because that's one group of people. Everybody who says they were Christian has not necessarily ever been a Christian. The other group of people is like the prodigal son. They are in the family. And if you read the story of the prodigal sons, one of the things that you can learn from that is that the son was always a son. He looked nothing like the son. He was doing kinds, all kinds of things, eating pig slop, running around with loose women, squandered all his, his, uh, his living and his inheritance, and, and he was always a son and welcomed joyfully back by the father. So sometimes you got people who are off in sin and we're going, I don't know if they were ever a Christian or not. They might just be a prodigal. And we might just need to continue to pray for them that God would draw them back. So guess what? We can't really know which one they are. We really can't. That's not up for us to decide. God knows about that. But if you know somebody who is like that and you're concerned about them, my advice to you would be share the gospel with them. Share the gospel with them. Not just Jesus is Savior, but Jesus is Lord. Okay? That's going to get both of them. I mean, if they're outside the family, that hopefully will draw them back in. If they're a prodigal, maybe it'll remind them 
that God, Jesus is not just forgive your sin and now live the way you want to, but he expects things of us. So, uh, but don't be the, make the mistake of being wrong about this here and going, well, I know X, Y, Z happened when it might not have. Continue to pray for them that God would call them and woo them and bring them back into the fold. So the short answer for this is we have to remember salvation is all of God, none of us. You do not earn it to get it, and you do not earn it by behavior to keep it. It is freely given, and thankfully, start to finish, it's all about him, because if it was up to us to live it, to keep it, none of us, who could do that? Who could do that? So, back to verse 12 here. Um, the application of this psalm in the previous verse is really made explicit here, and so the Israelites' lack of trust caused them to fall away, and this resulted in discipline, okay? And so he's talking about them fall, us falling away from the living God here. So the author of, the, of, of, of Hebrews here is warning these Jewish Christians who read these words not to make the same mistake as what happened out in the wilderness. So now, right here, the promised land is not a metaphor for heaven, okay? That's important to know. Israel's rescue from Egypt out of slavery is the metaphor for salvation, okay? The response by God to the Jewish people in the wilderness was not to go, I'm sending you back to, to Egypt. That would be like going, losing your salvation. That's not what happens here. What, what happens is that God denies them the blessings of the inheritance that they already own. And so th this is consequences of disobedience for children of God. That's what we're seeing here. And so, in fact, in the next chapter, we're going to get to this next week, and he's going to talk about the first thing he says is the opportunity for rest is still open. That even though if you they disobeyed, even though we disobey, the opportunity for rest is still yours. You just have to come back to him. And that is not by being saved again. It means walk in obedience. And rest is not salvation. Rest is peace and tranquility on the inside and a quiet spirit. All of that comes when we obey and follow God. So, um, so if you don't grumble and complain, but choose to voluntarily to submit to God and follow Him, then all that He offers in, in the promised land is yours. It's available right now. But, uh, so discipline is not a mark that God doesn't love you or he's turned his back on you. In fact, we're going to get into over to chapter 12, and what it's going to specifically say there is that discipline is a mark that you are God's son and that, or daughter, and you are in the family. That's exactly what it says here. That, that, uh, so it's not a sign of rejection by him, but that he was wooing you back because he loves you and you are in the family. So don't let a wrong interpretation of these harder verses here scare you into thinking God has rejected you and you've lost your salvation. Instead, what he says is to be vigilant. Be vigilant that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And, um, <clears throat> and then he goes on here, says twice there, don't harden your heart, and then he gives this rest of this, and he, he goes back here to Psalm uh, 95 there and talks about the, whole, the same thing again. And so there's a lot of verses on these two screens, but it's just coming back to that whole point uh, that we saw back up in verse 8. And he's going to quote this same verse again in chapter 4. And if you know anything about how Scripture and uh, especially Hebrews wrote, is that if they wanted to make a, a point important, it say it multiple times. So we got three times here in very sh close proximity where he says, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. And so that ends us at, at the end of chapter 3 here. But So what's the application? What's the application of all of this? So I want to do this by giving you an illustration uh, that I think it makes it pretty well. So uh, my daughter, Leah, some of you know her, graduated from college December a year ago, and she is now at echocardiography at Piedmont Eastside Hospital. 
And so in the year that she's worked there, I have learned so much about how the heart functions. She's always coming home and telling me, well, let me tell you about this case, and let me tell you what I saw, and all this kind of stuff. So um, because, because of the type of hospital Piedmont Eastside is, a lot of what she sees when she's scanning, scanning hearts there is coronary artery disease. Okay, and it is the leading cause of death in the United States counting for over 600,000 deaths every year, okay? And the impact on heart function can be quite dramatic. And this is, she got me these pictures. This is a normally functioning heart on this side. And you can see how well it squeezes up here and how free-flowing the valves are. That's the little flippy things in there. That's the blood flowing in and out. This is one with low ejection fraction. I learned that means that's a function of, uh, of, of damage to the heart. And you see it doesn't move very much, and the, uh, the um, valves are not as free-flowing, and it's just not moving as well as the one you see over here. And coronary artery disease is the main cause of this over here. And so uh, you know what coronary artery disease used to be called a long time ago? Hardening of the arteries. Very good. And what Le Leah told me about this condition here is the overwhelming majority of people who have this condition comes by lifestyle choices, okay? Poor diet, lack of exercise, substance abuse, smoking, stress, sedentary lifestyle, all these kind of things, poor sleep habits, all of these kinds go together to make your heart be like that. Not one meal, not one weekend, not binging an all-nighter when you were at college. That's not going to make this happen here. But it's day after day, week after week, year after year of choosing to do things that we know aren't good for us and contrary to health. It also means that for most people, this condition is completely avoidable, right? But the problem is that the impact of these things on the heart is unseen. We don't see it, right? And by the time people get to Leah, a lot of time the damage is already done. And the heart muscle is severely impaired. As I thought about this when I was writing this lesson, the thing that is true for hardening of the arteries or coronary artery disease for the physical heart is true for the hardening of a spiritual heart, okay? Hardening of the heart is rarely a single decision where people go, yeah, walking away from God, not, I'm turning my back on him, I was faithful yesterday, but today I want nothing to do with him. That's not the way it happens, right? It's daily decisions. One after another, after another, after another, where we don't listen to the Holy Spirit talking to us. Oh, we hear the exhortations of pastors and teachers, and we hear them say, uh, read books and all this kind of stuff, telling us to follow, telling us to do uh, what God says. But uh, it's just like a regular doctor, right? We sit at them, go to our, 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 our exams, and they say, get rest, cut, get exercise, cut out this, don't do that, start this over here. We don't listen because we can't see the damage that's happening. And we feel pretty good. Things are going pretty well. And we just keep on going down the path that we, we are already on. But you know what? Just because we can't see it happening doesn't mean there isn't damage happening. Daily decisions of unforgiveness, of anger, of resentment, of envy, of revenge, of self-hatred, of materialism, of self, 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 self of any kind does monumental and cumulative damage. And if we don't listen to the Spirit calling to us to prioritize what's truly important, slowly over, over time, we end up with a heart that doesn't do what it was intended to do, and that is to draw us closer to God and turn away from self. Now, I saw this quote online today, and I added it because it was so powerful. This guy says, it's often said that the gospel contains some hard truths. 
And the reason the gospel is viewed in such a way is not because its truths are hard, but because our hearts are. The gospel dares to confront us about the sin we love to commit. And I was like, oh, wow. Think about that. Just think about that right there. This includes every single one of us. And it brings us all the way back where we started, and that's a spirit of rebellion, right? We want to do what we want to do. And so when we hear the Spirit saying, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't go in that direction. It's going to destroy you. You're going to ruin your, your relationships. You're going to ruin your life. And we go, but I want to do it. I like doing that. I want to have just a little more control in my life. I just want to make sure things happen that way, so I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to give up these things. I'm not going to sacrifice. I'm not going to lay it down. And the point of this chapter is that we resist Christ's superiority in our lives. And he has a right to tell us what to do because of who he is, right? But that's the point. He's saying, don't give in. So if you're a genuine believer in, in Jesus, you know what? You've been given a brand new heart. That's what Ezekiel says. Took away the heart of stone, have given you a heart of of flesh and the exhortation of this chapter right here is to take care of this new heart take care of it pay attention guard your heart like proverbs says beware the deceitfulness of sin like this chapter says and aware of the lifestyle you're choosing every single day those little things that we like go by like eating pizza and nachos every single day it's gonna hurt you not if not might, but it will. It might take a long time for it to show up, but it will have damage to your spiritual heart in the way it functions in the long run. Impairment is not if, but when. And so, wrap up today, I'm going to let you look at Leah's, Leah's uh, scans there one more time and rivet it in your mind, right? Healthy heart or diseased heart? Good functioning heart or poorly functioning heart you get to choose and the writer of hebrews says to all of us today is the day do not harden your heart god we just thank you that um, you never give up on us that even when we're far away and doing things we know we shouldn't do that you continue to call us god open our ears so we can hear that and give us a spirit that wants to do what you said because of who you are. That you are the creator of all things. Not just all things, but you're the creator of us. And so you deserve praise and glory and worship. And God, whatever path we're on that leads away from you, God, step in the way. Turn us around so we don't end up destroying ourselves and the people around us that we love. And we ask you in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.